All right. If everyone wants to take their seats, we're going to get started with worship with our first prelude. Welcome. Welcome to St. Peter's. Welcome to St. Peter's. Welcome to St. Peter's. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord and rejoice and give thanks. This is the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. I invite you as you come to this space, a space that's new for all of us, a space that has been made holy by your presence here, to worship God, to give God thanks, and to give God praise, and to be a community of faith. I invite you to take a deep breath, allowing all of those emotions to fill your spirit and your body, to feel your feet on firm and solid ground, to know that the person to your right and to your left in front of you and behind you is your beloved sibling in Christ. Welcome. To St. Peter's. Now, typically at St. Peter's, in the last two years that I've been here, 
I say, we don't try and do announcement-y type stuff during worship. <laughs> but I'm going to beg my colleague for just a little bit of announcement-y stuff because it is necessary in this moment. So welcome, we are glad that you are all here, whether you are worshiping here in person in this particular space at 502 East or whether you're joining us online, we do have that capability and we are waving to you all online in the various spaces you find yourself in that you call St. Peter's. I do wanna point out that there are restrooms across the hall from this room and all the way down the corridor on the right as well. I wanna point out that um, you'll see some ushers walking around, and if you recognize some of our ushers, they are going to be extremely helpful in helping you navigate this space, and if they don't know, I promise you they will find someone who does know. I also want to say a couple of things. We're not going to do a whole big swath of what has happened yet. We will get that information to you as we have it but we do ask that you don't try to enter the St. Peter's building until we say that you can, okay? So you are welcome to be on the grounds, enjoy the grounds, they are open and available, the parking lot is an open and available space, um, and following this worship service, we will, if you would like to, some of us will sojourn over there and have a brief um, prayer service on the grounds. Um, if you would like to participate in that, we invite you to that as well. Um, there are also some pictures on the table as you walked in. I know some of you got an opportunity to take a look. They're just to give you a little bit of an understanding visually um, of what the inside of St. Peter's looks like because when you're standing outside of it, remarkably, it doesn't look like it's affected. And so you can't really see. So we tried to bring that to you the best way that we could. Um, I will say that some of it will be a bit traumatic for some of us as you look at that. So. Prepare yourselves, let the feelings flow, reach out to your pastors if you need support in that. Um, but really, it, is, it does my heart good, I know, to see all of you gathered here together as a community and in the many ways that you have already reached out in support of one another. So with that, I'm going to invite one of our leaders, Eric Smith, our congregational president up, to just bring you a word from his heart. It is heartening to see everyone here today. I really appreciate you changing your plans <laughs> somewhat and uh, joining us. And uh, we do have much to share, uh, so let me get to that. Um, our leadership team is, in fact, working very diligently on our response to the fire. And I'm really uh, just so impressed and appreciative of the way our team responded, um, especially on the day of the fire and then being able to relocate here today so quickly. Uh, I really am stunned at how quickly that was pulled together. I'd also like to thank the 502 East uh, Management Center uh, team um, for generously making this space available um, almost right away. Um, it's just uh, amazing how quickly that came together. Um, and I have heard, and on many other occasions, I have heard how generous the management team here at 502 is. I've heard people who work here say it's just a wonderful place to work. And so um, I know that we can all appreciate and respect that here at St. Peter's. Uh, so there are many in our congregation who rushed to the church building to be on hand as we uh, processed what was happening and began to consider next steps. There's really too many for me to, to go through the list right here in this announcement or this update. Um, that being said, I do feel compelled to thank Cheryl Keckler who discovered the fire uh, and uh, most importantly I'll tell you I have taken a number of deep breaths of relief and thankfulness that you got out okay <laughs> oh okay okay I thought you were okay and you didn't go in so that's even better <laughs> yeah 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 right yeah, exactly and that's why we're we're not in mourning today we're more just how we're going to rebuild so thank you for that. Uh, we also had Kelly Bradbury who called me to let me know what was happening um, and, uh, and was with me all afternoon as we considered next steps. Uh, John Crayler uh, coordinated with 502 East, among other things, and helped us 
um, and get here today. Um, and then finally Sue and I um, just right off the bat was like, please just come to my house, have a quick meeting, wasn't that quick. <laughs> and so she gave us quite a few hours that way um, and was very generous with her time and space. Um, so thank you. Um, and again, I, there's no way to just go through the whole list right now, but thank you all very much. Um, so because of the fast moving nature of the situation, uh, I, along with our Vice President Kelly Bradbury and our pastors, Lori and Dakota, um, and then our preschool director, uh, Lori Jansen, I'm not sure where you are, you're here somewhere, there you are. Um, we all uh, got together and, and talked and uh, as quickly as we could, uh, gathered information from the fire department, the insurance company, and the remediation company. Uh, the remediation company you may have seen is already out there working on uh, our building. And we made some quick decisions on behalf of the, the congregation, and we also took some quick actions. Um, so it's really important that uh, everybody understand our building is repairable from everything we've been told so far. Um, as Dakota said, you can't even tell hardly from looking at it from the outside. Um, that it has had a fire. Um, and so it's very important if anyone's asking you or uh, wondering what's happening, um, that everyone know we are looking to temporarily relocate uh, our ministries and our preschool and um, are fairly confident that we will begin the preschool year as close to on time as humanly possible. And it will be very close to on time from what I understand. Um, so just know that, uh, especially if you're associated with the preschool. And I've seen these situations with other schools too. I have an education background and it is kind of amazing how fast schools can uh, get up and running again. So um, with that being said, um, Susan Fleener, our preschool team leader, has let me know that our, there are a number of people looking to donate items uh, to the preschool. And uh, my understanding is we have a list that's gonna be published by email and social media of what would be helpful. Uh, so stay tuned to those channels and um, that will be communicated as soon as possible and we will get our preschool taken care of. In addition to that, we've had a number of schools uh, and facilities managers and so forth reach out and offer space to us and we're working through uh, those options this week. Um, and so that's the primary thing I want you to know is that your leadership team is gonna be working really diligently this week to assess all the information coming in and make decisions and uh, make sure remediation is continuing forward and repair is continuing forward and we're talking to the fire department and the remediation company and that we will be communicating with you uh, as soon as we know more and as soon as we have made decisions. So. Are there any burning questions that I need to know about? I haven't had a chance to talk with everybody. Um, so, yes. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, sorry, I used to be a teacher and that was one of my things. I'd say, okay kids, any burning questions before you get to work on this assignment? Uh, um, so, not, don't have time for a huge QA here, but if really if there's a question that maybe somebody you know is not here, you know, I would like to know that and I'm gonna hang around after the service, um, so go in there okay all right well with that I will hand over to our very capable pastor Lori Wallach thank you I, I'm kind of glad that you said burning questions because it's it's kind of important because we are a congregation that can laugh together. We are also a congregation that just names it as it is. And so the reality is almost every time a pastor goes on vacation, <laughs> we say, Don't call me unless the building's on fire. Don't call me unless the building's on fire. <laughs> So the building was on fire, and I was on vacation. And just to be clear, I am at a time like this. Isn't that crazy? So I'm not on vacation, and that is OK. Let's just be real clear about that. I will be with my colleague who handled things beautifully. I then arrived and joined, and we are in this together. That being said, for all of you who are really worried about me, and I appreciate that. I promise I will get back to vacation at some point. 
okay? I promise it'll happen. I also want to note, because I do think it's important for our friends online as well as those of you who might wonder, every candle you see here is battery operated. <laughs> In general, I'm not a fan. And that's where we're going to be for a little bit. I want to name that your responses are legitimate. You all have different experiences with fire. You have experiences of trauma. You have experiences of being away and missing something. You have experiences of laughter or something being really important to someone else and you not caring. All of that is a part of who we are now as a community. And so we're going to lean into that, and we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to adjust. We are a community that has been trying to be more accessible. That meant we had to move a few chairs because our aisles weren't quite accessible here. We are a community that is attempting to be more open and inclusive, and that means today, if you need a bathroom that does not does not quite fit how you identify yourself. Use whatever bathroom you would like. What I'm saying is, we had just completed a gender inclusive bathroom project. And so when we're in our space, there is space for everybody to do all the things. And when we are graciously welcomed into another space, we work with what we have and we honor that that gets challenging for some. Okay. We will still be that congregation. We're also a congregation. Look, I'm dressed like a mission trip today. <laughs> Some things don't matter. And we will continue to be that congregation. You are loved. That's what the t-shirts say, if you can get underneath here, just as you are. Now, underneath here is an interesting connection. Because when Dakota and I had a minute, <laughs> we both said, it's all fine. And it's going to feel weird without our stoles. Because most of our stoles were made for us by really special people. Or he just told a story about his newest favorite stole a few weeks ago. All of that is locked up inside the building. And the beauty was one of our colleagues heard that and arranged for us to have stoles on loan from Allisonville Christian. And so we give thanks for that because it feels so little and we feel super ridiculous even caring. But we care. And that will all happen along the way. We'll talk a little bit about our altar and some other amazing graces and parts of this story. But this time, this time is, us, is for us to worship God as we need to, just as we would have in our other space. It's to plant our feet and to check in with our hearts and be able to see one another and draw one another to our mind's eye and trust that we are not alone. Dakota and I just became members of the club nobody wants to be a part of. It's that tiny club of pastors who've had church fires. We don't want to be there. But we are, and we will journey with you, and we will find a way to live into who we are as St. Peter's, a welcoming community, sharing God's love with the world, and finding the spirit in life. One last detail. None of the music for this service changed. Pay attention as you sing and I need to make a note to our folks worshiping online, we simplified because we're at 48 hours post fire. So we do not have words coming online for you in future weeks. We hope to be a little bit more interactive. Um, but if you could listen, hum along, make up your own words, grab a hymnal if you have one on your shelf, some of you might, and trust that the beauty of the spirit will be among us. Let us rise in body or in spirit, wherever we are, to sing the first hymn in our hymnal, believe it or not, Immortal Invisible. Welcome.
in this time of centering, we are going to continue to create our worship space. I invited those of you who saw the invitation to bring something of yourself, to bring something that grounded you in God's love, to bring something that we needed as a community to make a part of our altar and worship space. One of the things I brought was one of my copies of our Centennial book. For those who don't know, this congregation was founded in 1905. It was founded by sort of a ragtag group of people. I will name that there were women in leadership positions even at that time. I brought this because the next chapter of St. Peter's story is ours to tell. At the centennial, we entitled this treasure, Epiphanies of the Spirit. We don't know the epiphanies that we will have as we journey through this season, but I trust that those who went before us will continue to guide us. And those of us who step up will continue to think of those who come after. So I've added that. And there is a holy family up here. The greenery is from our native habitat. One of our newest members brought a CD that has the song that led them to St. Peter's on it, so we can listen to that together. There are crosses. There are mirrors, and there are things that you are holding in your hand. So if you have something that you brought to this worship space, would you go ahead and bring that up now? And if you want to say a word, this mic is live. And if you don't want to, that's OK, too. Welcome, brave one. Oh, and this table is fair game as well, if you don't want to come all the way up. Love that. Look at that, vintage. Look at that. That is. I see we have the silent crew today. <laughs> it's great. I might narrate a little bit. I see fire trucks and fire bears. We do have first responders among us. There is history among us. That stole I recognize as my uncles, who also lived through a fire. Um, keep some in the basket. Robin Croft here doesn't really want to talk, so I'm going to tell the story. Robin was knitting or crocheting. I'm not good at that detail. Tiny little hearts for an event that was supposed to be last week on our grounds entitled Wonder and Wander. Robin is a sneaky one. <laughs> so her plan, unbeknownst to me, was to sprinkle these hearts throughout the grounds for people to discover. Because our spiritual life team is brilliant and they care about safety, the air quality and the heat index made that event impossible. So this morning, Robin showed up and said, I have these hearts, and I think we might need them even more today. So when you come for communion later today, or when you leave this space, if communion is not your thing, will you please take a little heart? Her recommendation is to hold it, and I promise they're soft, and to use it for prayer or to give it to someone who needs it even more. I imagine that they will show up in pockets all around. There is a tree of the world here. There is much that leaves a story to be told. And I know my colleague will tell you a few more of them. But for now, let us trust that there is beauty in each of these objects, and perhaps more so in their stories and in our hearts. Gazing deep within, 
and all around, we pray. God, we come to scripture in this time, awaiting a story that could change us. We see so many objects, and we know they are just that. We call to mind the many objects that made our church building what it was. We honor that many of them are no longer, but that we remain. And their stories will be told, and the love will be shared. So open our big hearts as we hold on to tiny hearts. Help us to connect to each other, to the characters of this scripture, and to you, one who continues to grow, to change, to challenge, always, always with a loving spirit. God, we see you embodied in each of these trinkets, in each of these treasures, and we trust that you will come into our hearts and into this scripture as we listen carefully. In your many names we pray. Good morning. Good morning. A reading from the book of Genesis 29, verses 15 through 30. When Jacob had been with them for a month, Laban said, Why do you work for me without wages just because we are related? Tell me your worth, and I'll hire you. Now Laban had two daughters. The older one was Leah, and the younger one was Rachel. Leah was nearsighted, but Rachel was lovely and graceful, and Jacob was in love with her. He said, I will work for seven years for the hand of your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban answered, I would rather that she marry you than give her hand to another. I accept this offer. So Jacob worked for seven years for the right to marry Rachel, but to him it felt as if it were a few days. That was how much he loved Rachel. When seven years were up, Jacob, Jacob said to Laban, I have worked for you for seven years. Let me now marry Rachel. So Laban brought together all the local people for a wedding feast, and there was a great deal of drinking. That night, however, he brought his daughter Leah for Jacob, and Jacob slept with her. Laban also gave Leah his maid Zilpah to attend her, to her, her that night. In the morning, Jacob woke up, and it was Leah beside him. Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Didn't I work for you for seven years for Rachel's hand? Why have you deceived me? Laban answered, it is not our custom to hear to let the younger child marry first. Finish this wedding week with the elder and I will let you marry the younger for another seven years work. Jacob agreed to finish the wedding week with Leah. When the week was finished, Laban allowed Rachel and Jacob to marry. And Laban assigned his maid Bil Bilhah to Rachel. So Jacob lay with Rachel too, and he loved her more than Leah. Then Jacob worked for Laban seven more years.
So I'm not going to make any bones about it. This is probably going to be the hardest sermon I'm going to have to give in my time at St. Peter's, but who knows what the future holds. We can't be business as usual, but we can be focused on God as usual. When I was writing this sermon on Thursday, I was writing one thing. And then the trauma happened on Friday. And I have to confess to you that I've been keeping it together for about 48 hours, so I'm sure the breakdown is in about five minutes. So that's, that's on its way, I'm sure. And I remember that Saturday I said I need to re rework this a bit. And I was talking to my partner, and he says, you know, they still need a message. He says, they don't need a message about a fire. They're going to get all of that. And he's right. We come to this space to worship God. We come to this space to be honest with each other. We come to this space to be inspired and transformed. So I'll try my best. So we've got this story about Jacob, and Diane read it so well for us, but I mean, the, sh the long and short of it is, is that Jacob is staying with his uncle, he falls in love with his cousin, and he wants to marry her, so he works for seven years in the hopes of marrying her. And then he's tricked, the trickster, Jacob, in the Jacob and Esau story, who tricked his older brother, is tricked. And he marries Leah. And then he works seven more years, and he marries Rachel, the end. That's the story for today. <laughs> but this scripture for me is so tough to make sense of in the 21st century. Some pastors that I've heard preach this text immediately go to the trickster that was tricked. Be careful what you do for it may happen to you. And some, you know, essences of karma are in that. But I don't really feel inspired by that. So then I looked to some other pastors and they talked about the importance of patience. That if you want something, you'll wait as long as it takes to get it. Something we're going to be put to the test in the next few months, I'm here to tell you. And I thought, well... I'm not inspired by being told to be patient because if you know me, if you worked with me, I'm about the least patient person in the world. So that text isn't doing anything for me. And then there's the thought of working hard for what you want. And I thought, well, okay, man, that's a little bit closer to we work hard for what we want and maybe for what God wants. But I just cannot separate those messages from the inherent misogyny and patriarchy that is present in this scripture. The audacity that someone like me would stand in this space reading this scripture and just say, see, work hard and be patient for what you want and you will get it even if it's a woman that's promised to you by another man. So I can't preach this text in some feel-good kumbaya way. I have got to give it to you unvarnished. Because I simply cannot believe that this, me this message, this particular story, this group of verses in this thing we call the Bible is valuable in any way. It's ridiculous to me that I would have to preach this text with the backdrop of people who are making such a mess out of a movie designed to empower women. Let's just set that up from the get-go. We're reading a scripture today about how one man promised two women, actually four women if you count the servants, to another man, and we've got people who are outraged about a Barbie movie. <laughs> right? I mean... It's just a bit much for me. It's also interesting that another backdrop of this text 
is the attack on reproductive rights in this country. I mean, we've been preaching about that for several months now, and long before that as well. And yet this is the text that we're coming to. What you don't get in this text is that we learn later on that of Jacob's many wives, the one he preferred, Rachel, becomes barren. That is a journey that many have gone through and lived through. Those stories matter and are valuable and need to be told as much as this trickster story. And then the backdrop is even more recent for me as I preach on this text in this body in, an, in, in a moment when at a crisis time the men asserted dominance in fixing it. And that is some work we're going to have to undo. That is some work we're going to have to be conscious of in the coming weeks and months is that it is always the men that are looked to to fix things, to solve things. They're the ones the contractors want to talk to, the ones the fire department want to talk to, the ones that the insurance want to talk to, regardless of whether they say it out loud or not. So that is all embedded in this text for me. I told you we were going to get it unvarnished. Okay? The only redeemable quality that I see about this text, yes, Jacob is, the father of the, is a father of the faith, and Leah and Rachel are mothers of the faith, but I just think that this serves as a good object lesson. I learned that from my colleague, Lori. She says, sometimes you don't have to throw it away. It just becomes a good object lesson later in like what not to do. This story belongs in the time and the place in which it was written. We do not have to take everything in this holy book and always apply it, everything about it to our current time and place. Because if we did, none of us would be working the pork tent on Wednesday. None of us would be wearing these cloths made of two different threads. None of us would be doing a lot of things if we adhered to our texts like this one so vehemently. Because I don't know that the misogyny and the patriarchy in this story inspire us to share God's love, to welcome all, and to find the spirit in life. I just don't think that. That's my opinion. You can think differently. I just don't think the story does that. So therefore, I would say we don't have to keep it as a story of our faith if we don't want to. I know that might be a revelation to some of you coming from different traditions that you say, how dare you? say that we don't need certain stories from our sacred texts. I say that as an opportunity for liberation from them, as an opportunity of freedom from the ones that we struggle with. I think we're called to serve God, called to love God with our whole heart, called to love each other as ourselves, and I don't know that this story helps me do that. I don't think we are called to love and serve the Bible. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. I don't think that we're called to love and serve the Bible. Because I'm really at about my wit's end with this thing called the Bible being used to justify bad behavior and bad theology. I'm really over it because we've had several exhibits of it in the last month. Lori and I got two different phone calls in the last couple of weeks with men on the phone. We didn't answer them, luckily. We got them in the voicemail, so we just got to listen. Just pontificating about how we were going to hell because we told people it's okay to get abortions. How we call people who have had abortions holy. And how could we call ourselves pastors if we're leading people to damnation? Exhibit B of bad theology and behavior were Facebook posts and Google reviews that were posted to the St. Peter's uh, Facebook page and Google site talking about 
how could we call ourselves Christian when we're confusing people that there are more than two genders? And Google themselves, with all of their many, many, many policies, said that's offensive behavior and took it down on our behalf. And Exhibit C was a letter that's still sitting on my desk whenever I get back to it that was written on college rule paper in very elaborate cursive that was writing to me, the male pastor, saying, women are not called to preach and teach and be pastors. And here's six Bible verses from Titus and Timothy that say so. You should be doing better. They must have missed the whole gay thing on my part, but <laughs> maybe there's a hierarchy. Women bad, gay okay, I don't really know. <laughs> it just baffles me that somewhere today, right now, there are churches and church people who believe it is their mission to inform us church people that we are not Christian, that our work is not holy, and that we had better repent, or it's not gonna look good on the other side of this. That is what they're preaching and thinking about right now somewhere, somewhere someone's doing that. But I believe, again, I said I, believe that it is their souls that need saving. Saving from the worship of an icon, the worship of an idol, the worship of ink and paper and binding that we call the Bible. They're the ones that need folks like us to help show them, to help demonstrate to them, not to beat them over the head with it, but to offer an alternative that says, this too is holy. This work that we do is, is put on our hearts by God. There is liberation in that for them. Early on in my ministry, I, I really said, I said, I cannot have be in conversation with people who think my existence should not be. I just can't be, it's not my ministry. There are some who are called to help bring people to that and be patient with them. I never had the patience for it. What I did was I said, that individual is loved by God, and I resign them to God's work. And yet, and yet, yesterday, when my worst fears for this congregation had been realized, the first thing that I grabbed was this book. The first thing that I rushed into a building that was still smoking, a building that I have cherished, the first thing I did was grab this. And I grabbed it not because it's binding and ink and paper that I worship, but I grabbed it because I said, it is this book that also has the stories that had this congregation call me as a pastor. Because it's this congregation that walks with a family that buries a child that was not accepted by many. Because it's this congregation that said that that woman over there, 20 years ago, was called to serve this congregation despite her gender and has done so faithfully and diligently and with God's love and grace. So I say to the people who would seek to look at what has happened at St. Peter's in the last 48 hours, and say, see, that's what you get? And I would say, no. It is not the one that throws the stone that is favored by God, but it is this community, and watch them, 
It is this community that will pick that stone up and build a table where all are welcome. This table, as we have said at St. Peter's, is not our table. It is not just a table that is made of either wood or plastic or metal. It's God's table. It's a table that's been consecrated by God to outpour love and inclusion and acceptance. And I have to believe that that God says, yes, some of the stories that somebody wrote down some time ago may not inspire you as they inspire others, and that's okay. Now, I know that that was like the whole kitchen sink of sermons. <laughs> and I know it didn't make a lot of sense the whole way through. That's what, that's what you get when you give me a troubling text and a fire in 48 hours. <laughs> That's about all I got, so. <laughs> what I have to say is to invite you to adopt an attitude of prayer with me. Gracious and bountiful God, I don't know if the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart were pleasing or not unto you, but they were words that I had to speak in this time, in this place, in this space, and with these people. You are a God of infinite forgiveness, of infinite love, and of unconditional grace. We know that no matter what we say, no matter what we do, we are your beloved. We simply ask, O oh God, that you dwell among us always in this space, in the many spaces in which we will worship, and in our hearts as we are a community that we beautifully call St. Peter's. Amen.
I made the rookie mistake of not bringing the Kleenex box up here. Uh, there are at least four of these floating around. Others needed them as well. And I'm going to put this one a little more accessibly for all of you as we get to this time of prayer. Some of you have already taken advantage of what we call our prayer table over there in the back. Uh, there are cards and an assortment of pens. If you need to draw or color or write, anything is welcome. There's a basket over there, and we will take them here. That's perfect. And Dakota has the microphone this morning, and he will hold it for you because we recognize that the fire is not our only prayer. The people who have hurt one another are not our only prayer. There is a lot going on in your lives and in our world. So are there prayers that in this time you would share with one another? And Amy's going to field them for folks that are online as well. Amy's right there. <laughs> For my friend Shelley, whose brother Bill passed away um, suddenly uh, Friday, I think it was. For a friend and his family who is was 44 years old and recently passed from pancreatic cancer. He leaves behind three daughters, freshmen in college, and two high schoolers. First of all, a prayer of Thanksgiving that we found gluten-free bread um, on short <laughs> notice. And but But I promised the, and so, a, give business to no label at the table on Main Street in downtown Carmel because she did us a, a quick turnaround favor and all she asked in return, and these are her exact words, please light extra candles, say extra prayers. We are trying something called Donut Day tomorrow with my employees, and I need all the prayers I can get. Oh. <laughs> you got them. We can do Donut Day prayers. Donut Day. <laughs> I will share from Emily Stahl, who is here. She's written a prayer for her dad and his eyes, uh, and now his new pacemaker. So we give thanks for the medical journeys that are challenging and the medical journeys that bring us to new realities. A prayer that we might embrace our challenges as old friends and feel our grief so that we might heal, we pray. Sometimes prayers make me laugh. Um, I thought the person wrote, may our erector God, but that really was creator God. Um, but I envisioned erector sets of my childhood, which is kind of beautiful in its own way. May our creator God lead us through this trying time. May we be open to whatever may come. I have heard from congregations in many states from people who were ordained in this community that are praying for us in their new congregations, uh, from that little club of pastors who pastor fire churches, and from many in our community who continue to say, we're with you. I want to name especially in prayers this little preschool conglomerate over here, and they don't always like to be pointed out, but they're gonna get over it. Um, this is really hard. And Lori, I will not make you speak, <laughs> but I'm going to use words that I know you were using, which is, we all kept saying, but what if? Mm -hmm. But what if? And when you see the melted tricycles, you say, what if? Mm -hmm. And so we are standing with all of those what ifs and recognizing that they need to be named. What Dakota and I have talked about is the amazing prayers that have come in this experience. 
fire chief told us as we were touring, um, these doors did their job. Friends, St. Peter's UCC, when it was built in 1974, did not always make the best choices. <laughs> there were some times at which building materials were not chosen at, let's say, the top level. But those doors were the best, and they did not skimp on them, and they did their job all those years later. Now, I will also say, a number of weeks ago, Dakota and I were approached by someone who will remain anonymous who said, is there any way we can keep that closet locked because it is too much of a temptation? We said, yeah, we can lock it. We always locked it pre-pandemic, but we got lazy because it was just easier to leave it open and teachers were going in and out and we wanted to have fellowship and all the things. And we're like, yeah, we'll totally lock it. We didn't start locking those doors till just a few weeks ago. We know that there would have been much more had that not happened. And so I offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the person who was really trying to keep their kids out of a toy closet, <laughs> but who actually saved all of us and many more. I also want to pray for the multitude of first responders because in one of those pictures you'll see all of them lined up. They had to call in extra people because I know you all know I don't like the heat. Nobody likes this version of heat. This has been a weird weather week and it did not help our fire. And those fire responders took turns, took in the oxygen, swapped out, the entire time. I give thanks that our communities are prepared. There is so much that we don't know, and there are so many prayers that you are still holding. Is there anything hanging out online that I've missed? Okay. There are realities in your lives that hurt, and they will need to be named. So if I can ask one thing, it is that I need you we need you to not, not say your prayers. It's okay to be worried about your kid moving to college. Prayers don't come in a hierarchy. The fire doesn't trump everything. It's okay to be worried about that surgery coming up. It's okay to question whether you accepted the right job offer. It's okay to say, my marriage is crumbling, this sucks. It's okay to say, I'm about ready to lose it with this dog. <laughs> you see, our prayers are personal, friends. I told you laughter was okay. Or the kitchen remodel. <laughs> or a few other things. This is what makes us who we are and how we will continue to be the church. So please, if you do one thing, do not let that voice in your head win that says this doesn't really matter. That is what will kill us because it all matters and it changes us and it stacks up. Hey, we got one. <laughs> I wasn't doing that for another one, but great, I'll take it. Oh, yeah, traveling. <laughs> uh, Carrie says, school starts on Thursday, Lawrence Township. Prayers for a smooth start to the school year. Oh, yeah. The, the rollout of school. Some of our kids here today have already started. Many others are still coming. Uh, the boys started a new school in a school district that has removed language that makes bullying an issue. For the excitement of a new school, but for the vulnerability in a community where we sometimes don't realize how much our policies matter, and for the pain and the reality of bullying in all of its forms at all of its ages. We got another online one. <laughs> another one. Yeah. <laughs> 
from Patty Peck. I took a fall last week and hurt my ankle and arm. Nothing broken, they don't think, but I'm mad and it hurts. I hope I did that justice, Patty. Patty's our spiritual life team leader, and she is worshiping with us from uh, Canada, New York, and uh, area on a river, which sounds glorious, except when you're in pain. Yep. See how prayers work? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, Liz Liz. Is um, So I brought my unicorn for a reason. Um, years ago, I shared the story of that unicorn. If anybody wants to hear it, I'll tell you later. But um, I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, but I brought it today. Uh, it took a lot to figure out what to bring. Um, because yesterday, I got to have unexpected healing from childhood trauma. Um, unfortunately, it came at the expense of traveling three hours away to a funeral to see people that I haven't seen in 30 or 35 years and discover that there were people who knew me not as a traumatized child and be able to tell them the things that they did for me. <laughs> um, when you talk about the fire and how the building looks okay, mm-hmm. my building usually looks okay, right? But there's a lot that's still, all these years later, healing. So I brought my unicorn, because yesterday I got to have some really important healing that I didn't expect. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, <laughs> I will tell the story of the cross because I didn't do that during the sermon because it didn't really fit. Um, But that came to me by way of um, seminary where um, I had a liturgy class and one of our projects was an immersive worship experience. So using all of your senses in worship. And so our team decided to do the handprints as the cross. What is interesting to me is that my parents are moving and this was somewhere in their closet from when I lived there. And they're like, you need to get all this stuff out of our house. (laughs) And this did not fit with their aesthetic. It doesn't fit with John and I's aesthetic for (laughs) our home. But I bet it will fit with the St. Peter's aesthetic. So (laughs) that's why it came to you. It does look like a jigsaw piece. So as we collect ourselves and as we prepare to approach the table, let's take just a moment to bring all of these prayers, the ones that have been spoken and those that remain in our hearts, bring them to that vulnerable place, that holding space, that unbounded space. And let God lead you and lead us. Mysterious one, God of flame and God of soot, God of generations, God of new life. Allow us to journey into the what ifs and release our tears. Nurture us as we receive resistance, as decisions threaten to overwhelm, as resentments set in. Nurture us into places of compassion. God, ground us in your many truths. Help us to hold on to the stories, the ones in the Bible, the ones that we live, the ones that we see on screen. And then lead us to actually use these stories for good, for transformation, for expansive and healing love. For we know that there is much to come, as there always is, 
We know that the laughter and the tears will commingle. The holding on and the letting go will be hand in hand. And maybe, just maybe, when one of us feels down, the other might feel up enough to accompany, to journey together, to offer assistance, or even just a listening ear. Help us to table our fears, to be firm in our convictions, to love this creation, to live our faith, and to affirm unapologetically all of your beloveds. God, humbled yet inspired, amazingly uncomfortable, lead us into these words and this season as we pray in a new way the familiar words, our creator God, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. So as I said, we will build a table. I don't know if we'll actually set out to build a table, whether we have one that's waiting for us in our sanctuary when we return or not. We will build a table either in reality or in spirit that is open to all. That's the way it's been. That's the way we will have it. That is the way God will have it and it will have no end. So as you come to this table, know that you are welcome to partake. You are welcome to abstain. 
and you are welcome to do all of it wrapped in the love of this community of God. God, these are elements. They are symbols. They are realities of grace. They are bread and they are cup. They are gluten-free and they are juice. They are not labels, but they are each of us. Bless the hands that made these elements and those who will be a part of the experience. Bless this table and bless those in the many spaces that worship in these times. We know that we are not alone. We know that in some ways this ritual changes nothing and in many ways it changes everything. Bless, bless the bread, the cup, each of us and those who are here just because we remember them. In your many names, God, be with us in this sacred time. Amen. It was on a night that Jesus was eating with friends. It was also a night that he was betrayed. And he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. And in a similar way after supper, he took a cup, maybe a few cups, and he poured into it, blessing it, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant that is being poured out for you and for many. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, ministering in the name of Jesus Christ, we invite you to receive these ancient symbols of God's unending love and grace. We're going to do this messily, <laughs> so come. We're going to invite the ushers forward. This is a never say never moment. Right. Because we thought that COVID was the end of intinction or dipping the bread into the cup. But you just said never. I know. Stand over there with But the thing is, all the tiny little cups and the communion ware and all the stuff are in the church. So, for those of you who are comfortable, you are welcome to partake by intinction. For those of you who would prefer a small cup, we have these amazing little cups. And I'm not gonna lie, they were labeled Jello Shot Cups. <laughs> it's what we have. <laughs> And our amazing ushers are willing to pour more of them if that is the preference of many. For those of you who are partaking at home, thank you for being a part of this sacred ritual. We recognize that there are many loaves and crackers and tidbits and treats and many things to drink. And it is all connected in this community across the miles. So come, for all things are ready and we will come to you if that's preferred as well. The table is here and we are ready for your goodness.
God, we give thanks for a meal that seems so simple, a meal that carries with it laughter and wonder and the next steps of our journey, a meal that also carries tears and questions and those steps of our journey. May the bread and the cup continue to sustain us all. In your many names, amen. That journey involves generosity, and we appreciate your generosity of patience, of love, of trust. We also appreciate your generosity of gifts. We promise we will let you know, and there are ways to give specifically. One of those ways is if three of you would like to work that aforementioned pork tent, we're down to two. It's not an auction, but we're down to two. <laughs> it would be incredibly helpful, and the congregation does benefit with um, uh, funding from the state fair if we complete that task. So if you have availability on Wednesday, talk to Liz. That would be great. You do get free admission to the state fair. I know, it's great. So there are ways to work at the porch tent. There are ways to give your dollars. There are ways to give your prayers. And we will continue to share how we give and what we can receive through the generosity of one another in a spirit of openness, in a spirit of not going too far, but pushing just enough. We ask for your generosity and your giving of gifts. For so much, mostly for perspective, for faith that changes, for the kindness of strangers, for the mystery that is your presence in each of our lives. Help us to continue to give of ourselves generously, 
to take each day as it comes and to trust that when we give, we give opportunities for others to experience you. For these dollars and cents, these papers and prayers, these dreams, and all that is ahead, we give thanks. Amen. song remind us, reminds us, death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on heaven's side, so too shall we be landed on heaven's side after all that is necessary to happen in the weeks and months to come. That is where we shall be landed safely on the other side in God's comfort. So whether we go with questions, whether we go in a fog of confusion, whether we go with happy hearts and whether we go holding on to some stories and letting go of others, we go in the name of the Creator and the Christ and the Holy Spirit. And the reality is we don't go far because all the treats are right over there. <laughs> you church people are ritualistic and you like to exit a door before you go get your treats. Just get rid of that plan. Talk to one another, enjoy the space, have some treats. If you'd like to come over to the native hab habitat, we will briefly pray over there at some point. And please take hearts and whatever you brought with you, because in case it isn't obvious, we don't really have storage space. <laughs> so with that, we ask you to be just who you are, mm. the beautiful people of God, who will continue to share goodness, to love mercy, to find kindness, and to do justice. This is only a beginning. Amen. Amen. Putting stuff on the altar? Like oh, okay. Take a walk.
nice to be involved. Yeah, it's good to be here in person.